Um, I just was going to share with all of you my experiences with anxiety and depression um, from, well, that have been ongoing for the last, uh, my whole life really, but um, especially for the last 12 years or so, um, and sort of the, the, the personal trajectory that I've had there. People who have sort of mild mental illness also often uh, prefer not to discuss it uh, publicly, and I totally understand that. This is by no means everybody's experience. In fact, everybody's experience with any mental illness is different from anybody else's experience with the same mental illness. Um, um, and so the reason that I'm sharing my story is not because it's exceptional, but actually because it's very common, I think. Of that quarter of people that have experiences with mental illness, um, more than half, typically around two-thirds, don't seek help for it. And again, there are a variety of different reasons associated with that and reasons for that and social pressures and so on. The, just earlier this semester, they had the, the um, across the CFA lawn, all of these backpacks for the Sin Silence Packing exhibit, um, trying to bring mental illness out into the open. Uh, and, and I think that that's a really valuable thing to, to raise general sort of public awareness of mental illness and the commonality of it. To those of you who know me, uh, uh, you pro probably isn't a surprise to know that I'm a little bit of a kind of shy person. My experiences um, are very much captured by this, you know, this sort of constant internal monologue, like what's appropriate, wait, when should I talk in this conversation? Okay, wait, if I... In addition to that, since I was, I don't know, like... Well, actually, if you ask my mom, since the day I was born, I was an insomniac, um, and she'll happily tell you about um, uh, about uh, the the um, five minutes most at a time that I slept as an infant. Um, but my um, my own sort of experiences with mental illness um, and with sort of depression and anxiety um, as an illness um, were something that I sort of wasn't even personally aware of as such until um, until much later in my life. Um, and, you know, everybody goes through times in their life where they sort of face challenges and things become overwhelming. Um, for me, the, the, that time, as, as I'll sort of talk about in a little bit, came up uh, not during college, um, but after I finished college and when I finished graduate school. You know, when I graduated college, I was 100% certain that I was going to be this famous researcher and I was going to solve everything there was to do about the brain. Um, and then graduate school ended up being a really difficult time for me because the ups and downs of research um, just sort of wore on me a lot. Um, and that's not everybody's experience. Um, there are plenty of people who find that they can sort of work with the ups and downs of research. Um, but for me, that was just sort of really exhausting um, and, and ended up causing a pretty significant episode of anxiety and depression. Well, I, I think that there, there are a lot of people who do wonderfully well in graduate school. Um, there was plenty of tedium in my wife's experience in graduate school. Um, but for her, it wasn't as exhausting uh, personally as it was for me. And so I think that for me, for whatever reason, um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't sort of as invested as I'd hoped to be in the work that I was doing. And that really made it harder for me to, to do well at what I was doing. Um, but I did end up you know, finally publishing my thesis work. Um, and, that, um, um, and that was um, an exhausting experience to get through. And by the end of it, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was just um, really kind of at a complete loss. I was sick of doing research. I had spent all this time sort of planning on being this famous scientific researcher. Um, and um, at the time, I was like, OK, well, maybe I'll go to medical school and um, you know, just you know, use my biology background that way. And I can, I could, maybe I'd be a great doctor. Um, and, uh, or maybe I, should, uh, I looked into like, nursing programs and science writing programs and all this stuff. I knew that things weren't where I wanted them to be. And I didn't quite know what I wanted to do yet. Um, and I was, um, I, I, I was having, I, it came to a point maybe six months after I finished graduate school where like I just couldn't keep repressing anymore this, this tension that I was feeling about where I wanted to be. And I just like, I just shut down. And there was a good week to a month where I was just literally like day and night sweating bullets. I couldn't pick up a piece of paper without it getting wet from the sweat coming off of my hands. Um, I kept myself hydrated. I barely ate. I had just like 
practically no sleep for that three week period. Um, and uh, I, was, I mean, couldn't go to work. I was just a complete and total wreck um, during that time. Um, at least for me, it was really hard to sort of know that all of this thing, that all of this trouble was in some sense in my mind because I felt like I should have some control over that. And, um, and that made it even more, um, even more sort of distressing and debilitating for me um, and sort of fed on this, this cycle of, of, um, of worthless feelings that I was having because I, I, you know, it, it, if only I would feel better, then I would feel better. First of all, for me, very, very hard to sort of recognize that there are things that I didn't have control over within my own mind at that time, and even still now at times. Um, so, um, so anyway, uh, you know, that was that was all going on for me, and there was a, so there was this month long period where I basically couldn't get up out of bed and c couldn't hardly do anything. Um, but I but I did manage to get myself to see the th this therapist. Lexapro, which is an SSRI that's like Celexa, and um, and at the time a sort of moderate dose of uh, of clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. Um, these days I typically take just kind of a low dose every day of that, um, and that sort of you know for me is what my body needs to keep functioning. I've actually tried a few times to sort of take, take myself off of the medication, sort of feeling like, okay, well, I've got all these other tools. I've developed this. Uh, so, so I have you know, cognitive behavioral therapy that I practice, uh, mindfulness meditation that I practice. I sort of start thinking, well, okay, those things are sort of taking over. I don't need the medication. And I've tried going off the medication, and then I always end up anxious and, and, uh, and in these ruminating uh, periods. And so for me, I feel like the medication is sort of what my body needs to just function properly, and that's, that's what I do. Um, again, sort of everyone's experience is different. Um, but so, so I, um, I, was, I, was, I, was, I had started on these medications, and after a few months, I, I was um, making some progress with my therapist, sort of discussing a lot of the anxiety actually centered around this idea that I had screwed up my, uh, my thesis work, and that this publication that I'd made that was sort of the cornerstone of my PhD was, um, was wrong, and that we'd messed up and left out some critical control. And I was convinced, completely convinced, that any day now somebody was going to figure out that I'd left out this critical control, and they were going to come and take away my PhD, and I was going to lose all that I'd worked for, and my wife was going to leave me because of it, and, and all of this. And I would, you know, it sounds a little bit unbelievable now, but I, I knew, I knew that that was going to happen. I was as sure of that as I was of anything. Um, Actually, in some period, there were some periods where I had some delusions that went even beyond that, um, to the point that I thought that my thesis advisor was um, was an actor portraying a, a, P, a, a PhD person, and there were even times when I thought my wife was an actress portraying somebody who she didn't really actually love me. Um, there turns out there's a name for that; it's called the Truman Show delusion. Who's seen the Truman Show movie? So there was actually, yeah, that was I actually had that for a period of time, for like a month and a half. I was convinced that I was like in a world surrounded by actors and everyone was just filming me and I wasn't mm -hmm. in on the whole thing. So anyway, which is not, um, which is not super common with depression, but it turns out that depression, this is, um, depression with psych psychotic features is what I had at the time and that's, um, you know, not super common, but, but, but not completely rare either with depression. Um, and, and so as I was sort of starting to come out of this, um, uh, there was a time, maybe six months after the whole thing started, when I was starting to feel better, you know, maybe like starting to see friends again a little bit more. Uh, but a lot of my close friends knew about some about what I'd been going through, um, and there was there was one night in particular when I was mostly out of kind of the worst of the experience. Um, I wasn't sort of feeling this constant, you know, panic, this constant, unbelievable, crushing anxiety, but I still had these feelings that, like, in the long term nothing's going to work out. In the long term, I'm not going to be successful. I haven't figured out what my career is going to be. I'm just trying this teaching thing because it's like a thing to do, because what else am I going to do with my PhD if I'm not doing research? 
and um, and so I um, uh, and so there was there was one evening when um, uh, the our two closest friends um, uh, another uh, another married couple uh, that that uh, they were close friends with my wife and I <coughs> excuse me um, came over for dinner um, and uh, and you know we were talking for a little while and sort of like kind of having a good time it was a, it was almost kind of nice how sort of normal the dinner was. Um, there was one point in the middle of the dinner when I started sort of having more feelings of anxiety and uh, and concerns about the future, um, and so I uh, and so I excused myself and went to the went to the bathroom and took uh, maybe like four of the clonopin pills, which is probably a little bit more than I was supposed to take at the time, but. Um, uh, but you know, a few of them just sort of helped me calm down. Um, then I came back and joined them, and then uh, and then you know they stayed for dinner, and then they said good night, and they left. Um, and then my wife went to bed, and I was um, and I was really um, you know still sort of having these feelings about long term what's going to happen, um, and long term you know certainty that you know, I was just I was just going to fail at the next thing I tried and fail at the next thing I tried, and it was going to be this huge burden to my wife and um, and you know maybe you know we were thinking about having kids in a few years, and I wasn't going to be able to help her take care of the kids because I'm just going to be this constant wreck. Um, and so I decided that night um, after she'd gone to bed that I was just going to take the rest of the bottle of clonopin. Um, and so I sat down to, um, to write a note um, explaining to her how I was going to be this burden and why um, she was better off without me and why um, this was, you know, I, I know this is going to be hard for you when you wake up in the morning and discover this, but, but, um, but you know, trust me, you'll be better off um, kind of thing. And, um, and I wrote the letter and sort of read back over it, and I felt like I didn't quite capture right what I had wanted to say to her. Um, and at the time, I said, "Okay, well, it's I, I can do this another day." And so I said, "You know, I can do this another time." Um, so, and, and I just, I didn't, uh, another day I'll be able to write better, another day I'll be able to explain this better. And so I put the note away, I didn't end up taking the pills, I'd had them right there next to me, but I didn't end up taking the pills. Um, and um, this is uh, a quote taken from the, um, from the uh, uh, Unquiet Mind book um, that you uh, that you recently finished reading, um, and you know it, it captures, I think, a lot of what I feel. Also, like um, I, I, I don't ever expect to live without mental illness. I'm not even sure that I would really want to live without any anxiety at all. Um, I would probably never accomplish anything if I didn't have some sort of anxiety helping me move. The severity that I had is something I can manage to go without again. Um, but, but, um, but for me, I mean, it's, it's, it's a constant disease. That is a sort of chronic disease that requires constant monitoring. Um, but it's not, but it's something that's so sort of integral and so sort of um, fundamental to to my personality that I can't really imagine existing without it um, entirely, and it's something that instead I just I just try to manage. And for me, having anxiety and depression as a sort of constant companion in my life um, means that I'm always reminded of how lucky I am in some sense to, to be alive. Um, but, but um, you know, the, 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 the remissions, the resurgences, the upticks that come um, all sort of just serve for me now as a reminder of, um, of the value in enjoying time with my kids, in enjoying time with my family, in enjoying as much as I can everything that I do in a day. And I think that that is really, um, in a sense, uh, 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 a gift for me to have. It's not, you know, I wouldn't want to have, I wouldn't want anybody to have to go through the periods of, of trouble that I've been through. And again, I know that there are 
many, many people who've gone through way, way more severe um, uh, experiences and still made it out than I have. Um, but um, um, but I don't. Um, but but I, I, I you know having the reminders actually I think sort of for na- for me since I'm able to now manage my disease, um, the reminders actually serve to sort of help me remember to value the time that I have and the joy that I do have. Even if you feel that things are currently in an awful state, is something that I think everyone can choose. Um, And even if you feel like you have no power to make things better, um, you can at least have the power to want things to be better. And that's something that, um, you know, I hope people um, uh, can, can recognize. And I wish that everybody knew that at least the power to hope for something better um, exists within all of us. And, you know, one, so, so this, this, um, this, picture here uh, uh, is, she, this is a woman who actually, I didn't, I've, I've never met her, but she teaches now at the place where I was an undergraduate at Rice University in Houston. Um, and, uh, and so she points out sort of the ups and downs. She has a job very much like I do, teaching. Um, and she points out the ups and downs of teaching, which it does have its ups and downs and its joys and its, its sort of challenges. Um, and you know, if, if, you, if you say, okay, so, somebody with anxiety, severe anxiety, and they either can be in a lab where they're going to work sort of on a project day in and day out, or have a job where their job is to stand up in front of 40 people at a time and talk about, um, about uh, you know, this and that and present research papers and you know, manage discussions and all the stuff that I try to do with my daily work. You know, what, on the face of it, it sounds like the, the life in a lab is really sort of the, 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 the trajectory for somebody with my, with my sort of mental health um, uh, fingerprints. Um, but it, it, it's not the right job for me. And so for me, what I take that to mean is that a mental illness does not need to be a limitation any more than not liking uh, physics needs to be a limitation. You know, um, it's something that it's important to understand about yourself. And if you, uh, and if you have a mental illness, or for me having a mental illness, that doesn't mean that I can't do a job, hopefully, that I can't do a job where it requires sort of putting myself in a public position on a regular basis, um, as long as um, it sort of works with um, the other aspects of my personality. Um, and so I guess kind of the point that I put, up this, put this up for is that for me, mental illness, I feel, doesn't need to be sort of a, pers- a sort of permanent limitation. First of all, one of the things, in thinking back about what happened with me, I never told my wife, I never told my psychiatrist, I never told the social worker I was working with about the feelings of suicide that I was having. And that is really weird to me. If I had cancer and I go to see a doctor and they give me some medications and they say, okay, this is the medication and by the way, With the kind of cancer you have, there's a chance that someday you'll wake up and it's going to metastasize in your hip. And if that happens, we've got to get you into the hospital right away. We're going to get your whole family down here. You're going to need to find a bone marrow donor. We're probably going to have to give you an artificial hip. And, you know, but it's either that or you're going to die from the cancer. I guarantee you, if a doctor told me that, the second I wake up with the tiniest pain in my hip, I am calling the doctor, I'm telling my wife, I'm calling my parents, I am getting everybody I know aware of what's going on. I'm in the hospital, I don't care if I'm there for a week, I don't care if I'm there for a month, I don't care if I'm there for a year. The second that that symptom shows up, I'm going to go there. And so, you know, having this symptom associated with my mental illness that I knew could come from my mental illness and hiding it from my caregivers, from my family, from the physicians who were taking care of me, 
to me illustrates my own stigma that I had about mental illness and my own lack of trust in these people's ability to put my interest first. Um, and I now know that, first of all, the response wouldn't have been as dramatic as I, as I feared if I had told these people about the thoughts I was having. But second of all, um, I came close to attempting suicide one day, and that wouldn't have happened if I had told people about what, it, uh, about what I was experiencing. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention about this and about sort of my experience is I hid my suicidal thoughts from people. I knew, I looked up online what the common symptoms of suicide, of suicidal thoughts were, and I intentionally made sure that I did not demonstrate any of those. I didn't want people to know. I'm sure that if I, if I had gone through with this and I killed myself, that my wife and my therapist and my parents would have all found things that I had said to them that they could trace back as evidence for what I, had said, for what I was thinking. I couldn't hide it entirely, but I did a pretty good job. And I can't speak for anybody else, but I know that I forgive my family for missing that. And I'm lucky enough to know that they forgive me for hiding it. And Mental illness and illness in general, life in general, comes with suffering. Um, but the way to get past that suffering is to open ourselves up to forgiving ourselves and forgiving other people. Did you get to refuse the people who challenged your... No, no, I'm... I, 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 I'm, I'm for me, doing bench work is not the thing for me. And re refuting them would involve more bench work. I can make arguments, but actually stepping outside of the conversation for today, one of the big things um, in general with um, thinking about science is you don't win a scientific argument with, with ideas and logic. That's a part of it. You need those things. Um, but you win a scientific argument with data. I don't have any, like, great advice about what to do universally in those situations. But there is a tension that exists between sort of the trajectory that you're on and the what you want to be. And that's not always the case, right? Sometimes you're headed exactly toward what you want to be, which is great. Um, but everybody's going to have times where it's whether, you know, whether it's a relationship you're in or whether it's your career or whatever, where the where you are or where, where you're headed isn't lining up with where you want to be. Um, <laughs> And sometimes the right thing to do is just to throw out, is just to, to, you know, cut your losses with where you are and move fully toward where you want to be. And I wish I could say that, like, you should just always follow your heart and do that. Um, but I don't think that that's necessarily always the best option. Um, it lends to the possibility of sort of chasing things too much and never focusing on one thing for too long. Um, on the other hand, I also sort of wish I could say um, that, that you know, whenever these things come up, you should always just sort of stick with where you are and stay, on the, stay the course with what you've done and everything like that. Um, but that's, of course, not a great plan either, because if, you're, if where you're headed is not where you want to be headed, then, then a change might be needed. And so for me, I kind of, settled, I kind of ended up moving toward a teaching career um, as a compromise between where I had already sort of put myself headed toward and where I um, and where I um, uh, and, and, and where I you know kind of really wanted to be, which at the time was sort of okay, well, just go dump this PhD thing, go do something else entirely, um, and that ended up working out well for me. Uh, that sort of compromise. That doesn't mean that that's always the right solution for everybody, but anyway, for me, that's sort of where I went with that.